morning, everyone. My name is Larry Peran. I am the president of the Optical Student Chapter here at the University of Puerto Rico. And today I have the pleasure to be hosting our first version of a woman in office. So the main focus of the webinar is to show how women have achieved great things in optics and photonics. Really nice outstanding plenary speaker today that will be sharing with you the actual research that they are doing and the career path in optics. So let me introduce first uh, our first speaker that is doing. She is a currently a research fellow, fellow in the Turning Lab in the Wellman Center for Photonic Medicine at the Massachusetts General Hospital and the Medical School in Boston. And she is also an Optica Ambassador of 2021. So with that being said, uh, Lynn, Dr. Lynn, the, the audience is all yours. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, can everyone hear me and see my slides all right? Yeah, everything is, is going fine. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm really glad to be here today. It's a great pleasure to share a little bit about the story uh, of, of uh, my uh, career and also like optics. Uh, so my title is Optics and Me. Um, so I will just uh, start with, um, Sorry, just give me one sec. Yeah, so basically my journey with optics started uh, from my undergrad. So I'm from China and I did my undergrad in Tianjin University. Um, I did a bachelor in engineering um, and the major was instrumentation and metrology. This is the major that is really multidisciplinary that we learn a little bit of everything. So we, had, uh, we have to take courses from um, like electrical, mechanical and optical engineering. And what caught my attention is when I had a lab tour to the laboratory of micro nano manufacturing technology or MNMT. And this is a lab that is specialized uh, in the design and manufacturing of freeform optics. And at, at that place, I've seen like optics that are designed, you know, like they are not ro uh, rotationally symmetric and they have created like wonderful patterns and really different shapes that for all different kinds of applications, for example, like illumination and also like um, the AR VR glasses um, in 2013 and 2011, that's really, really a uh, new thing for me. Uh, and I was intrigued and joined the lab as a research assistant. Uh, and my project at that time is trying to mimic um, the, um, um, the insects compound eye. Uh, because they are really different, unlike our optical system, which usually only have one aperture, they have multiple apertures facing different directions. And the way that we want to approach this is to design an um, artificial compound eye that are compact and can see like a really large field of view. So I, that's my first touch with uh, the freeform optics. And uh, I did a lot of optical design and there were a lot of interactions between me and the engineering team and see how the nanofabrication work. So it was a really great experience. So here are just two photos uh, showing like uh, my previous, uh, like this, that's the department. And also that's me and my mentor at the time, she is the grad uh, PhD student. We graduated at the same time and she, she taught me all the basic optics and it was a great experience. So basically this experience uh, of two years being in a lab as an undergrad research assistant, let me know how it, how it is like in China to be a graduate student because you know I, I've seen graduate students all the time and I get curious. So what if I move to another environment to learn more? And that's how I decided that I want to move to Canada for my grad school. Uh, and the reason that I chose Canada uh, was because um, I wasn't sure if I want to do a PhD, uh, even if I'm sure, I'm not sure which field that I want to st uh, start. So it's a huge commitment if I want to directly start a PhD. Um, but in Canada, uh, a good thing about it is like, if you do a Master of Science, that's a thesis-based research program, they would fund your scholarship. They will provide you with scholarship that supports your studies, like cover the tuition fee. And also, you know, basically like um, you have the fellowship for two years to conduct research and take courses and to explore what you like. That's what I did uh, at the University of Calgary. Um, 
And at that time, uh, I was majoring in electric engineering and uh, in the integrated circuit and optical imaging lab. Uh, my research was to design optoelectronic system to support neuroscience studies. Uh, so I work around the campus. Uh, this is a photo of me with my spectroscopic system um, to different neuroscience labs to you know, discuss with them and also measure uh, in the mice that they have. So, uh, and here is a photo of my previous group uh, in Calgary. So, um, and also like at that time I started to um, also explore more about optics because now I'm already in the optics field uh, about like neurophotonics. Um, so <clears throat> the research that I, I started was on diffuse reflectance spectroscopy, which is an intrinsic optical technology to sense um, blood related parameters. I'm going to talk a little bit about this today. And also like, because we're targeting neuroscience studies, we also need to miniaturize those devices. Um, and then apply them for uh, neuroscience studies. Um, so I started like presenting at uh, Optica and also uh, other conferences and get to know a lot of friends. Um, and we are still friends until now, like every year we saw each other at conferences. Uh, so this is a great experience. And also um, Calgary is extremely cold. Uh, this is just like an example of how I look like in the winter because usually it can get to like minus 30 Celsius uh, during the day. Um, but it is really different with uh, my undergrad, but um, I got like great team, a uh, great environment. And also like this is how I started like more uh, seriously in optics. Um, and I decided to stay in actually in the same lab for, for my doctor degree. Uh, and I stayed there together for six years, um, but working on slightly different projects. That's also the time when I get involved with Optica. Um, that's how I started with student chapter. We have a combined chapter with Optica, SPIE, and IEEE Photonics, and we call it Opti uh, COPS, that is Calgary Optics and Photonics Student Society. One unique thing about Calgary is that it is a city that is focusing on oil and gas industry. So everyone in the city are doing something related to oil and gas. So very few people are working on optics. So outside the, outside the university, we, we didn't really know if there are many companies out there. Uh, to my knowledge, there is only one. Um, so that's why like a lot of our, our activities are tailored for this. Uh, one is to gap um, the, uh, bridge the gap between uh, academia to industry because we are students, we need to look for jobs later on, but we don't have the industry connections and all those things. So a lot of events are bringing in like all, um, outside speakers. Uh, for example, like this photo is actually like we had our Optica um, ambassador visit. Uh, so this is Eric Chung. And also this is Dan Christensen, also another uh, Optica ambassador. And actually this is the start why I became interested in being an Optica ambassador because they provide really great um, like career advice and also really spend the time with the student chapters. Um, and for example, like Eric John, like he spent 10 hours because it was a snowy day and he was with the chapter officers and really provides us with like career advice and share his uh, career path. It was really inspiring. Um, and here are some like, for example, here are the speakers like Dr. Uh, Soon and Katarina Swenbergs. Uh, and they're really great um, big names uh, in laser spectroscopy. Um, so another focus that we do is optical outreach because really few people knows about optics and photonics. So that's why like um, in, in the earlier in K-12 education, they learn about optics, but they don't really know how to, uh, how, uh, this is a career path, that this is a career option for the future. So uh, we have conducted a lot of optical outreach. Um, some of them are supported by uh, the Optica special grants um, for education. Uh, and what we did was we drove to the rural schools, uh, which are usually like two hours away from Calgary. So they have really limited resources to science museums. So we will like bring uh, we will bring all the optical kits uh, with our demos and also with slides and we drove into those um, rural schools in their classroom to share the joy. So this is usually really welcomed by the teachers and also by the students because they are really different with 
who will be learning plus um, since everything is hands-on and you know like they can really touch a laser and see what the optical fibers is like um, and also like it was a great joy for all the volunteers because we get a chance to see the excitement uh, from the children and also like we can share all joy and excitement about this technology um, so uh, I spent four years with the student chapter and they're still doing a great job right now. And uh, um, like to me, like student chapter is actually uh, opened a lot of door for me, um, like at conferences and also like even my postdoc position was through connections that I got to know through the student chapter. So um, it is, a, um, I, I, I really recommend anyone any student, if they have the chance, uh, get to learn more about like what's going on in their student chapter and how they can get involved. Then after I graduated from my grad studies, um, I moved to the US for my postdoc. Um, so basically I'm at the Wellman Center for Photo Medicine. Um, this is a research center uh, in the Massachusetts General Hospital and we are affiliated with Harvard Medical School. And what we do here is to uh, explore the diagnostic uh, and, uh, um, and also treatment using optics. Uh, so currently I'm with the Tierney lab uh, and I'm focusing on the in vivo microscopy. Um, so I focus on two different technology. One is optical coherence tomography and also confocal um, fluorescence microscopy. And I uh, focus on pulmonary and airway imaging. Um, this is a photo of our current lab. We are a huge lab with 100 people because we do translational research. We started from um, research and then move all the way until clinical studies and really want to um, make them for um, future patient care. And here's a here is a photo of the system uh, which has like many combined lasers, a so really good looking system that I really enjoy working with. Uh, again, I'm still doing outreach here. Um, some of the events are still like uh, supported by Optica. I'm really grateful for that um, uh, resources. Uh, and uh, we have a YouTube channel, Out, um, Wellman Outreach. If you're interested, we are actually posting uh, videos about our current research to disseminate what we are doing here. Um, the series are, uh, we have uploaded the first uh, video and there will be more to come. So um, that's about me, uh, my career in, uh, in optics uh, in, inside the classroom and in the labs, but there are more about optics and that I play with cameras that I really enjoy walking with my camera, cameras around. And here are some photos that I took over the years. Some of them are in Calgary, some of them are in like Banff National Parks and also here in Boston. Uh, definitely like optics is a huge part of me. So, now let's switch gear and um, I'll talk a little bit about my research. I'm not going to dive into really detailed uh, today, but if you have any questions or would like to learn more, I will be happy to chat afterward. Um, so firstly, um, my graduate research, which is uh, for functional brain imaging. So functional brain imaging is actually for visualizing uh, and mapping what's the physiological parameters to study how the brain works. It is not only like structural imaging as usual. Um, so their optical contrasts are really useful uh, and they are very advantageous um, compared to traditional radiological parameters. Um, so usually based on whether we need foreign contrast agents to be introduced, um, they can be classified into extrinsic and intrinsic optical signals. And all my experiments are based on uh, intrinsic so that means these are label-free technologies. And usually these ones are using uh, metabolism um, parameters and the common uh, intrinsic optical signals are scattering and absorption. So here it shows um, like the absorption coefficient of hemoglobin. So in the brain, uh, the most, um, the most uh, dominant chromophore that absorbs light is hemoglobin. Um, so here it shows uh, the absorption curve across different wavelengths. Um, oxyhemoglobin, that is HBO, that means the hemoglobin that carries oxygen. Um, so the shape of it has two absorption peaks. Well, the hemoglobin, uh, the oxyhemoglobin, the hemoglobin without carrying oxygen has a different shape. 
So basically, the basic here is uh, we want to look at what's the shape of the spectrum. And from this, we can tell like how much hemoglobin that carries oxygen. And basically, that's the parameter of oxygen saturation. Uh, another parameter is blood volume fraction. So basically, we have more blood in that volume. Um, what would happen is like more light, more light would be absorbed. So basically, by seeing the shape and also the amplitude of the spectrum, we can tell like what's the intrinsic optic signals and uh, figure out these two parameters. And these two are really important biomarkers for brain because um, they are a direct, indirect measurement of neural activities. Since uh, the, the brain um, activity would take up energy, that energy is actually delivered by the blood which carries the oxygen and glucose. So that's why it is an uh, indirect way to show like how, uh, which part of the brain is active and also a really important tool to study what's the relationship between neuronal activity and blood. Um, another thing that we, uh, I want to talk a little bit about here is freely moving animals. Um, so um, in neuroscience studies, it's really important to conduct experiments where the animals are freely behaving and freely moving. Um, this is because um, there can be artifacts introduced by anesthesia. For example, like it, it, it's known that they can change the normal physiology of the brain. Uh, and also like, otherwise we also need to, we may need to restrain the animal and that can induce stress and also change the physiology and the behavior. Um, so some of the mini HRS devices look like this. So basically like, for example, this optogenetic, a really famous um, um, and commonly used technology uh, in, the, uh, in the neuroscience com community. And basically they implant the fiber and use light to stimulate a certain part of the brain. So the animal would carry this part and there is a fiber connection uh, with a bench top system. Similar with like this kind of mini HRI microscopes. Um, the animal carried this part, which is really small. And then they have fiber and also wear connections to a bench top system for data acquisition for power. The other kind of system is something like this. It's a standalone system. That means everything is packed in that small system and the animal is carrying them around. Definitely this part, this kind of systems are better since the animals are not tethered, but it's also more challenging because small things um, has to be compact. Like the system has to be more compact. So um, the basic idea of my graduate work uh, for single fiber spectroscopy is that we want to measure the intrinsic optic signals uh, from the brain region. Uh, this is really hard to access and also like functional MRI or other technologies cannot really reach that brain region. The idea here is that we want to implant this fiber just like optical, uh, optogenetics and to a target region. And then the optical system would deliver light into the uh, tissue and the light that has interacted with the tissue will um, come back through the same fiber and go to the spectrometer. The system design is relatively straightforward. We use a LED as a light source. The light is collimated and focused into a multimode fiber. The fiber is a 20, uh, 200 micrometer diameter core. Uh, and also we can conduct Monte Carlo simulations to see like how big is the volume that is sampled by this uh, fiber. Um, so we have an idea of like whether we are targeting, what kind of uh, brain regions that we are targeting while we are implanting. Uh, one, uh, and then um, the light that coming back from this fiber uh, will be collimated by the same lens again and the beam speed are like um, directed and uh, send it to the spectrometer. One thing that we want to note here is like the reflection from the fiber can also be collected this way. Uh, and because we're using the same wavelengths, uh, it's going to be a baseline of the signal. Um, and uh, that's going to reduce the dynamic range of the system. And to reduce that, uh, we did a small trick, which is to angle polish this fiber. Um, so the fiber end here is at an angle such that the reflection and the signal light, they will go different direction. And we use that to remove the baseline. Um, and we did like ZMAX simulations uh, and also like some fiber polishing uh, to uh, enable that. Um, and then uh, basically like system design, like we, again, like we make it uh, for the animal system. Um, and um, I'll just like um, go through 
the end. So basically like um, here, uh, we have the system uh, connected to the animal where the animal is freely moving. And from this, uh, we can extract what's oxygen saturation and correlate it with what's oxygen level in the box uh, to uh, as an estimate of how, the, how accurate the system is. And basically with this system, we were able to get the oxygen saturation, which match uh, the environment control that we did. And also this is the first demonstration of hemodynamic monitoring in the deep brain uh, from the freedom of the animal. Okay, I think I'm running low on time. Just want to double check. Um, Larry? Yeah, we're, st we're still, we are entering in the five minute question, but you can finish if you have something else to say. Um, sure, actually, I think maybe I can stop here. Um, and uh, um, because I did prepare something about my graduate um, postdoc research, but I think maybe I'll just skip it for now. Yeah, go ahead. And I just want to show my acknowledgments of, of everyone that who has contributed to my research in the past. Yeah, thank you. Okay, sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting presentation. So if anybody have questions, so you can put it in the Q&A panel, right? So to make a question about the research or you have a question, something that bites about the career in optics. So now is the opportunity to make it. So while we waiting for somebody to ask a question, maybe I have one question. <laughs> Go ahead. So in the in the slide number seven that you were showing the the modeling and up to modeling uh, up, uh, absorption, right? Mm -hmm. You show that there is the fraction of the blood. Yeah. Is there how how do you measure that for for I me mean, for the for the slide or for the sample that you are working on? Is there any way any way to approximate that value or something or yeah, definitely. So basically, like there is a way to find out what's the concentration based on the modified beer Lambert law. So basically, beer Lambert okay. law uh, correlate like what's the concentration of a chromophore in a volume um, of um, basically like it depends on like what's the passant of light that travels in that sample, which can be simulated by a Monte Carlo simulation. So basically, if we know that what volume that we are actually sample from and how much absorption happens there with absorption coefficient, we can calculate what's the concentration of hemoglobin in that region. And that can be correlated to what's the volume of blood uh, in a single volume of tissue. Okay, yeah, that's very nice. Yeah, Monte Carlo is very useful to, to make those simulations. So, yeah. yeah, definitely. Um, and and the, the, the coefficient, you are, so with that research, you are available to determine it like, how much of among of hemoglobin and how much the concentration is for each one? You, you can make it the, all the total hemoglobin concentration. What you get. Yeah, um, sorry, I, I think it's a little bit cut off on my side, but if I hear it correct, um, basically it, it, with the shape, because it's a combination of those two different curves. So by seeing what's the final shape, it can tell us like what's the percentage of oxy and deoxy. So that okay. would gave us like the parameter of, you know, like um, what's the total number, uh, total concentration of hemoglobin and among, among that total number, what's the percentage of them are oxygenated? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, that, that's really nice. That's nice. Okay, I think we have here uh, one question, the Q&A panel. Sure, yeah. Um... There's... You can see it, right? Yeah, I can see it. Uh, yeah, for sure, I'll answer the first question. Um, definitely, yeah, Calgary is really relying on the carbon-based products. Um, so that's why like, when we talk about photonics to the young kids, most of them don't know about it. And most of them doesn't even know like what engineers are doing because we're actually going into the rural regions. Uh, most of the kids, they are actually more interested in you know, like uh, getting other kind of jobs. They imagine like engineers are driving trains or things like that. So it, it was always fun to ask that question. Um, but they are just 
you know, pure curious about optics, like they cannot believe what they have seen when we are using a mirror to reflect the laser, for example, to the ceiling or something, they are just like excited. Um, so definitely, I think like the, the kids, they don't really care about that. This, they are curious um, natively and um, they just enjoy the session. And we do want to present them that, okay, there is a career, career path that you can go through. And I'll go for the second question. For sure, yeah. Uh, the second question is like, um, if I have ever thought about moving to the industry, definitely. I've been like oscillating so many times um, since my master's. Um, and let me put it this way, still until now, sometimes I'm thinking whether I want to move to industry. I think this is just an ongoing question. The more I learn about industry, um, I, I realize like I don't have enough information to make that decision. Um, I, um, so basically like, um, let me put it this way. I used to think like this is a career path choice, like academic or industry. But then I realized there is industry research and there is also academic translational research like the one that I'm working on, which is almost the same as r and So definitely it is not a clear division. And uh, I do think like, um, I don't have a really good answers for now, but I'm still exploring and I will be willing to share about the lessons I learned in this exploration. Yeah. Okay, Ling. So thank you very much, Dr. Ling, for the presentation or your bio for the students that are attending this meeting today.